Bill, we want to encourage people to go to Defenders, go to the Defenders series, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the Defenders topic and series today that mentions John Walton and uh, look at a response that he has made to you that's making the rounds on YouTube. Um, tell us a little bit about the, what, the, what the series was and uh, who John Walton is. We've discussed well, him before. I take it that this would be the series I did on Doctrine of Creation. And I looked at Walton's views um, of the narrative in Genesis 1, where he argues for a mutually exclusive distinction between what he calls material creation and functional creation. Material creation is bringing something into existence that did not exist before. So, for example, when a carpenter makes a desk, that would be an example of material creation. Functional creation would be when something begins to function in a certain way. And the example Walton gives is, is, is of a restaurant. Imagine a restaurant that is a renovated factory. And you could ask, well, when did the restaurant begin to exist? Well, the answer would be when it opened as a restaurant, even though the building was already there. You don't go back to when the factory was originally created and say that's when the restaurant began. Rather, it's when the building began to function as a restaurant. Hmm. And he uses this distinction to claim that Genesis 1, in describing God's creation of the light, the seas, the dry land, the sea monsters and creatures, and finally man himself, that this is really just specifying the functions of these things and not actually bringing them into existence. Okay. This is from uh, a podcast. It begins, Bill, with um, uh, a clip from you uh, that Walton uh, interacts with. Let's go to that now. I think I have a clip here. Let me see if this will play. It's about 30 seconds, and it should, um, you can respond to it. Whether uh, Genesis 1 describes God as bringing into being the things that are described, uh, whether he uses material or not, or does he merely specify the functions for things that are already in existence? I think that we have to guard here against erecting false dichotomies. Just because a text speaks of God specifying an object's function doesn't ex exclude efficient causation as well. Walton has to show that the text of Genesis 1 is concerned exclusively with functional creation. It is not enough to show that functional creation is involved. He has to show that efficient causation does not come into the picture at all. That was William Lane Craig, obviously. He speaks of you very highly. He said that, you know, that you're super bright person that you're a prolific author you know he obviously spoke about you very highly um, he said that he had correspondence with you so he obviously understands that that you're a scholar of top rank right but he has the, one of this is one of the critiques that he has and i just wondered did you want to respond to that and kind of tell us what what do you see wrong with with that critique well one of the most common critiques um you know dr craig didn't make this up one of the most common critiques is people who say, why can't it be both? You know, it's all well and good to talk about how order and function and role and purpose are significant in the biblical text, but why can't it be material too? Mm -hmm. and that's basically the nature of his question. Uh, I don't have to prove that it is only function and order. It's not like the burden of proof is on me. I had to prove that there was function and order involved. Now, he sounds like he's assuming that material must be involved. You can't assume that. Uh, prove it to me. Show that material is involved. And so I go through day one, nothing material. It's time, light. Those are not material. Day two, space. 
nothing material. Day three, it says, let the plants grow. Let the dry land emerge. It doesn't say he made them. Nothing material. Day four, he made the sun, moon, and stars, or he did the sun, moon, and stars. Okay. It, those sound material, but of course, they're not to the Israelites. And therefore, an Israelite wouldn't read day four and say, oh, here God is making material objects. Well, no, they don't think they're material objects. They think they're lights. Day five, let fish swarm, let the birds team. You know, it, when day after day after day after day, it doesn't talk about the material. That, that leads me as a hopefully sensitive reader to say, that wasn't very interesting to them. But again, I have to emphasize that doesn't mean that God did not create the material world. Of course he did. And when he created the material world, our theology tells us he created it out of nothing because there's no material that, that was not created by God. So I absolutely believe in creation out of nothing, but I don't think Genesis 1 is talking about creation out of nothing because creation out of nothing is a material category. And if it's not talking in material categories, then that is not its interest. And so... Well, let, let's let him finish right here. In that sense, I feel like there's a burden of proof that they need to pick up to say, why do you think that it is material? And they're trying to say, I have the burden of proof to prove that it's not material. And you yeah. heard what my proof is. Yeah. Okay, Bill. Anyone who proposes a particular interpretation of a text has the burden of proof to give supporting arguments for that view. Walton supports and enunciates the view that Genesis 1 is exclusively about God specifying the functions for the things, not bringing the things into existence. And if he's going to maintain that, then he does have a burden of proof to support that point of view and to show that it can't be both, that it can't be both material creation of objects and specifying their functions. Now, those who maintain that this is about material creation are not saying that these are created out of nothing. That's a red herring that is that needs to be uh, not pursued. Whether there is material stuff out of which the animals and plants and seas and so forth are made, or whether it's out of nothing is uh, immaterial, no pun intended. <laughs> the question is, does God bring these things into existence over this six-day period? And that's very obvious that they do over and over again. God says, let there be, and there was. Um, so he creates light, he creates seas, uh, he creates the dry land, uh, the lights in the heavens. Um, these things didn't exist until God created them. And so the whole narrative is about how God either said, let there be, and these things come into being, or it even says God made them. Um, and before they were made, they didn't exist. Uh, for example, in Genesis 2, reflecting back on the creation of man, it says that before God created man, there was no man to till the soil. Uh, and that before he created Eve, there was not found any creature that would be fit as a helper for the first man. So, Clearly, material creation of these things is being described, as well as then assigning to these material things various functions to carry out. Bill, clarify a little bit for us what we mean by material. We're, we're talking more yeah. in a metaphysical sense here because uh, he's listing some things that, uh, you know, scientifically you'd say, well, yeah, that has matter or, uh, you know. Yeah, Kevin, you're right. I mean, see, Professor Walton is an Old Testament scholar. He's not a philosopher. And so he uses this phrase, material creation. And for any philosopher 
That's just completely misleading. Aristotle delineated four kinds of causes, efficient causes, material causes, formal causes, and final causes. And when Aristotle talked about material causation, he means the stuff out of which things are made. Mm. So I mentioned the carpenter making the chair. The carpenter is the efficient cause of the chair, and the wood or the lumber is the material cause of the chair. And so Walton is using terminology that is very confusing in talking about whether or not Genesis 1 involves material causation. What he is really talking about, as in the clip from Defender's Class, he's really talking about efficient causation. Is God the efficient cause who brings into being these various objects? And it's not a question of God's bringing into being the matter or the material. The question is, does he bring into being light and the earth and the heavens and the seas and the swarming things in the water and the birds in the air, the lights in the firmament? Well, of course he does. God, in each case, is let there be, and these things come into existence. So what is described in Genesis 1 is one exercise of efficient causation after another of various material objects. Okay. There's a couple of minutes left on uh, Dr. Walton here. We'll continue. Uh, great point. Um, so, yeah, I really like both of you guys, of course, and I'm sure you, you guys like each other. Obviously, I'm sure you, you've appreciated some of the work of Craig as well. Um, I've actually talked to Craig's people. I may end up having him on the show, um, they said, per perhaps. So we'll see. Um, but I would love to hear a discussion between you two in the future at some point. You know, maybe that would be fruitful for the edification. Well, he mentions that we've, that we've communicated, and we have, mm -hmm. and I've told him these things. And I've told him about places where he's misunderstood or even misrepresented me, and he hasn't changed anything. So that makes me feel like he's not really much interested in productive thinking. And I'm just not interested in arguing with people. I understand. Well, thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, we're going to go to Q&A. Uh, well, Bill. Uh, hmm. Right. Uh, we, we had some correspondence, and I felt that he was confused, as I just explained, and um, that therefore my criticism stuck. And there was no need to change these criticisms because they were accurate. Um, I, I think in the clip that we just watched, you saw some of those same confusions where he talked about whether the things were material objects or not, and whether or not this involved creatio ex nihilo, and so forth. It, it's, it's a very confused discussion. But at the same time, I do want to emphasize my appreciation for John Walton. And in my forthcoming book, In Quest of the Historical Atom, if you look for his name in the index at the end of the book, you'll find that he is cited over and over again, sometimes with approval, but also then sometimes he comes in for criticism. So uh, I, I both appreciate him and also disagree with him on certain things. Sure. And Bill, I'm, I'm not sure where you would, what you would change or where you would change it, even if, uh, even if you wanted to. In, in other words, he's interacting with a clip that you've already recorded uh, with Defenders. And the only way that if you could acknowledge a, a change or a sea change or acknowledgement of his view after interaction with him would be on on one of these podcasts or on a future Defenders. Well, I think what he may be thinking of, Kevin, is the time in between Defenders 2, ah. when I taught Doctrine of Creation and offered these criticisms of Walton, and then we had this correspondence because somebody sent in my lesson or something. And then I taught Defenders 3, where we went through that section again, and I didn't change anything substantially because I felt that I had responsibly exposited his view accurately, 
and then offered some very telling criticisms. And he's absolutely right when he says this criticism isn't original. He says, everybody says, why can't it be both? Why can't Genesis 1 be both? God's bringing the things into existence and specifying the functions that they shall fulfill. And and I think that that is certainly the majority view that that's what is involved. It's both. Very good. Thank you, Bill. We'll see you next time on the next podcast.